thought it's a good idea to, to as a church, start this dialogue, start this conversation, start thinking about how, you know, what do we mean by this? Do we, do we still want it? Do we believe it's important? If we do, what does it mean for us? Uh, what are the practicals around it? So, so all that we want to do now in these two classes is just start putting out some thoughts out there and other ideas for us to, to, really con- to have a conversation and together formulate and decide how to move forward. We, I on purpose kept the word a cycling relationship on there because it's a term we know whether we've got positive or negative the connotations to it is just, I think we know what we talk about when we mention it. Uh, and, and the other reason why I just leave it as it is for now is I do not want the term to become the issue. I want us to talk about what does this mean for us? What does the scriptures talk about it? Let's understand the reason. Let's understand the why. Let's decide what we do with this. And then we take it forward. So let's, let's get our focus on the right, on the right place is what I would what I would recommend, um, and, and that's what we are trying to do now. And again, as I said last week, we don't have all the answers. This is not the 10 steps to, to discipling bliss, and uh, all, all problems will be sorted. You know, we, we did talk about the fact that there are people that has had some, some really negative experiences in the past. There's people that's been hurt tremendously. We want to be, we want to acknowledge that. We want to understand that. Um, and it's, it's sometimes difficult if you were not in the same situation to, you know, one could maybe think that, you know, after 15 years, surely we start to move on and they bygones by be bygones. But the, the, the level of hurt that some people have experienced is really severe. Some of the, some of the hurt that people experience may never, they may never recover from. We need to recognize that. We need to be sensitive about that. So what I'll do now is I'll just do a quick recap from last week and just putting it up there sort of a summary if we want to put up put up a definition what we think what we want to say when we talk about about discipling we talk about relationships between disciples with the purpose of encouraging teaching, teaching training and helping one another grow spiritually right so we, we all understand this but what I want us to focus on is the relationship aspect here Last week I tried to highlight the fact that discipling is not a, can, ne- can never again be a form of control to, through which an agenda is driven and through which people are in a way forced to behave and, and act in a certain way that then it's not necessarily bought into but because of the authority and the hierarchy of the church people felt obliged that they just need to do what their disciple tells them to do. And we want to move away completely from that. Right? That, that is what I, want, what I want to make absolutely clear. We do not support that at all. So it's all about the relationships and it's about helping one another. So I, I would say, from, from my pers- personally, I would say that the goal in the end, what we want is we want to have two-way peer-to-peer relationships. We're all adults. We, we want that. We want those relationships on a level on a level footing. You know, nobody is, no one over the other, peer-to-peer, two-way. That is what we want. We believe that is what the scriptures teach. There's a however there. I think we also need to, we need to be wise. There are diff- some relationships will, be, will have different needs. And just two that I highlighted there is maybe for, for young Christians or newly restored Christians, newly married. They've got, spe- they've got other different needs and they need a little bit more guidance that relationship will probably look a little bit more like mentoring. So, and I think we need to be aware of, aware of that. Again, the focus is on meeting the needs. And it's important for us to, to have that as our focus, to, to understand what are the needs. We can't just blindly think that we don't have needs. We know we do. And we can't just think that this is all about just being good friends and good buddies. It's, it's about understanding one another's needs and then understanding and deciding, discussing, considering to help one another. So what I did do here, this is what I had up last week, I wanted to state what I believe it is not. It's not all of that bad stuff that I already mentioned. I think what it, what it should be is something more like this. It's something that's relationships built on the foundation of love, faith, humility, mutual, mutual respect. And so deep, there's possibly, I think there's two types. I think each one of us need two types of 
of relationships in the church, the peer-to-peer -peer really good, deep friendships where we really share everything. You know, we are open. We are, we get down to the level where we really understand one another. We share really deep stuff with one another. A spiritual brotherhood where we really feel completely <coughs> bound to one another. You know, that nothing can tear us apart. That's a kind of unity that the scriptures talk about. And I think if we are at those those, that depth of relationships, you know, we can really talk honestly with one another and there, there will be the, the level of trust where we will accept what the other person say, even if he doesn't say it in a nice way. But you know, we know each other to such a level that you, you, you assume the best, you appreciate what your brother or your sister tell you. And I think then the other, other type of relationship which I think is important is we need to consider in our own lives the areas where we are not as strong and where we need to grow. And think, who are those people that we do look up to? Who we think are great examples in parenting, marriage, um, finances, the ministry, whatever it is. I think it's, I think it's healthy to seek out people that can, that can help us in, in, in various areas of our lives. So I think the message that's, come, that's, that's coming out and I, as I speak to people in the congregation is that we don't think of one that... You know, a structure where everybody has one single disciple is healthy, help or, or helpful. Because we can never meet everybody's, you know, I, if I have a friendship with somebody, I can't meet that person's, all that person's needs. It's just not possible. I'm not Jesus. And uh, so, so we need many, many friendships. The Bible talks about many advisors. But I think the important thing here is, is the commitment you know, and the, the, the level, the depth of, the, of those relationships. And so it's up to each one of us to evaluate those friendships and relationships and to really seek the depth that may or may not be there. Right, so I talked quickly last week about the why. I talked about, I see it as two areas. I see it as, it's just God's nature. God is all about relationship. He's the Trinity, three completely separate pe persons but perfectly united and uh, you know Chris help me out if I'm straying in areas I should really not but I mean it's a theological sort of you know, problem isn't it because we don't really understand it but the point is it's God is perfectly united in his, in his triune nature and everything about the scriptures is about relationships he, cre he created creation to, cre to have a partner to have a bride to have to, to have that com com communion with a person. Everything about the scriptures is about relationships. So that's the God we serve. So obviously, naturally, we will, we will desire those, those you know, depth of relationships. And then our nature is we are made in God's image, so we are made for deep relationships. And there's a sort of a negative aspect to our, to our nature that we, 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 we have to recognize. You know, we, we are blind to our own, to our own mistakes. And that's where good relationships really help. And it's good to have deep friendships where somebody can call you out and say, well, you know, this, is, this area of your life really needs a focus. Or maybe, maybe we are hurting it from past experiences, but we don't see it. And when you have a good friend, they can help you understand where, where, that, you know, where that hurt is and how to overcome that. Then the spiritual second law of thermodynamics. We all drift. We're drifters in our nature. And we will drift away from God if we don't have one another to, to, to hold us all together. And that's the point of unity. And, and the church, why we don't just get zapped up to... Uh, sorry, did I go the wrong way? Yeah. Okay, so what I thought for today, what I want, to, want us to think about is just go a little bit deeper about why is discipling important. There are so many reasons. I started listing it up for myself and I thought... I can't just put it all up here, I'll bore you to death, and you probably know it all anyway. I mean, it's, this is not what science is it. But what I thought is important is just to review some of the real principles, like confession. Confession is really important. You know, ask, us, ask ourselves, you know, when last did we sat down with the brother or sister and just confess sin? You know, I think sometimes we become really sophisticated. It's like we've been disciples for a long time, and my sin is sort of, I'm standing in grace now, I don't have to focus on my sin. But sometimes the problem is the scriptures talk about, you know, that 
we become dis- hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, we need to remember that confession is an incredible tool. You know, if we confess our sins to our brother and sister that we have this really great deep friendship with, they'll pray for us. And through the Holy Spirit, we get we get healing. Amen. Look at that second one. I love that scripture where it talks talks about you know that Satan might not out- outwit us. Now, the context of this that Paul Paul told the church to forgive the brother that sinned and you know, to, to bring him in and to not let Satan outwit us. Now, the context is about forgiveness, but I think the principle holds for, for all, for everything in our lives. Satan's got a specific plan for each one of us. He's very crafty. He's very busy. He knows you very, very intimately. And, and what is important is that if, if we are surrounded by spiritual people that are bold and will call us out or help us see what Satan is planning for our lives, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll not be unaware of his schemes. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, do we have that level of relationships? Because that's what I think we need to strive for. Blind spots, I already talked about that. You know, we, we don't really see our, see, see our sin. I love that scripture, as challenging as it is. You know, we flatter ourselves too much to detect or hate our own sin. Context may be, you know, about what a typical evil person is, but sometimes our hearts are like that. Sometimes we are like that. We, we, we don't see what is wrong in our hearts. And just because it's our pride, maybe we just love our sin too much. Because that's why we sin. We don't sin because it's a, a chore. It's, we sin because we like it, right? So then, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has inside draws them out. I love this scripture. This is again... This shows how important it is to have that deep level of, of relationship. You know, we, we all get, get hurt through life. Um, and I think, especially for those who become Christians when they're sort of more, maybe more mature, the, the life you live in the world, you, you, you pick up so much hurt and so much, you know, scars from, from what people have done to you, hey, sometimes in the church as well. And, um, you know, and, and I think many of us, and I'm definitely from a, from a male perspective, we are always very good communicators of what's in our hearts and what we think and what we feel. If hopefully your wife is like my wife, who who will not stand for shallowness, uh, she will she, she demands depth and the discussion. And after all these years, I still struggle a little bit with that. But in our discipling relationships, if we've got those that level of depth, how amazing is that? That we can really understand one another, and those those purposes of our hearts can really come to the surface and you know, be, be, be brought to obedience to Christ. Right, so what I thought is important for us as a church, maybe we should think about discipling as helping us with a vision, you know, supporting a vision. What is the vision? Let's not get hung up with the mechanics of discipling, is it good, is it wrong, which scriptures do we use, but what is the vision? What are we trying to achieve here? I love what Chris uh, Watkins did a few months ago. Uh, he talked about the found founders uh, principle or something like that. But something that he did while he was talking about, I think a year or two before that, about the Holy Spirit. He had like a chart where he showed the different stages of cre- from creation till till now and then future. And then each stage had, a, stage had a certain purpose, right? The stage where we are now, between now and judgment, is preparing the bride of Christ. If you think about it, it makes things so simple. It's not about our jobs. It's not about our kids even. It's not about anything that we sometimes really hold so important, and which for our lives are important. But what it's about, it's about preparing the bride of Christ. And um, so the context could be twofold. It could be go out and make disciples, bring so many peop- as many people into God's kingdom as possible. But I think also preparing us. We are, the, we are Christ's bride. And what an incredible special privilege that is to be one day united with, with God. I mean, this scripture is just amazing. This is in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth and heaven has passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Right? Isn't that amazing? Just that, that image you, the picture. You know, that's how God looks at us. We are His amazing, beautiful bride. <laughs> And so the vision I want to put before us as a church is that that is what, what, we, what we tried, what we are, and what we want to do as we continue in our lives at together, as a, in, in unity, we want to prepare this bride, to make this bride as 
as beautiful and perfect and pure and clean as possible. You know, and then, so that, and I think that's where, where discipling is a huge help. It's a huge tool. If we, if we have these relationships, you know, encourage one another daily, as long as it's called cool today, so that no one may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let us consider how we may spur one another on to want love, love, and, love and good deeds. You know, we proclaim, he is the one we proclaim, admonish, teach everyone with all this concern. We may present everyone fully mature in Christ. I think that should be our vision. If we look at one another, we, you know, if I look at myself, I know, I know I am not where I need to be yet in my spiritual walk with God. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that we should look at one another with judgment, but walking together, calling one another higher, drawing closer to God, growing in our wisdom and our understanding of God and the Spirit and and, and, and all the amazing um, you know, benefits there are to being a Christian. And then in our relationships, we will sharpen one another. You know? It's not just, a, you know, like I said last week, a golf buddy. You know, just somebody you will call up now and then, you know, if I call him up, he's going to maybe feel you know, obliged, let's go play golf or let's go watch a movie or whatever. No, no, it's, it's so much more than that. It's, it's walking a life together. Right, so, and, and, and so if we, if we fulfill this vision, what kind of church would we be? I like what Malcolm said when he talked about our relationship with God and getting deeper in our relationship with God. He always ended up with, what kind of church would we be if our quiet times looked like this, if our prayer times looked like this? And I think, I want to echo, I want to sort of follow that pattern and say, what kind of church would we be if we have these kind of relationships where we don't just brush over issues when they come up, where we, where we really have the guts to call one another higher, where we have the hearts to really lay our own lives down for one another, where we, where we go the extra mile and where we really serve one another, what kind of church would we be? I think we are, in many ways, already that church, and it's amazing. I'm so privileged to be part of the church, but there's always room for growth. And I think also it's a sustainability thing. If we do not keep on with this, you know, there's a risk that this may peter out. And we may become, you know, like what so many churches out in the world where people just come for a Sunday service and never talk to one another. And don't have the amazing support network that we do have here. Right. I'm going to hand over to my lovely wife. She's going to say a few words. Um. He needs to do the tech. Right. But maybe stand, stand to the, on that side. Because they want to look at you, not on me. <laughs> right. So we thought we'll talk a little bit about some guiding principles. And I, like, I'm going to allow Lizelle to talk, talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Um, I think if we put God first, and if, he's, if our relationships are God-centered, then there's no space for personal judgment or our own opinions, but it will be about God, and that will be the standard. So then we can't go wrong. <coughs> to, um, in our discipling relationships or our faith partner relationships, whatever you feel comfortable with, we need to be loving servants, we need to be great listeners, we need to seek to understand, not to judge each other, and focus on each other's needs. Years ago, I was in a, um, I was in a really uh, desperate situation where I was really hurting, and um, I had, I had to be, mo- I moved from a marriage Bible talk to a singles Bible talk. My disciple had changed at that stage, and my whole world was upside down. And um, I remember I had this one friend. She, I've known her for a long time, and she kept calling me and calling me and wanting to talk to me. And I was just like, man, I just can't. I feel like I don't have anything to give. I've spoken to people. I've, I'm just hurting so much that you know I just don't. I can't have this friendship with her. But she just continued calling me, she continued serving me, bringing me flowers, writing me little notes, giving me cards, and she just kept on um, persevering, she just persevered in our friendship, and it was so amazing that, you know, during that time, I just realized, you know, God has put her in my life for a purpose, and I started allowing her in, her in slowly, and um, 
trust was built and um, it was just, it was amazing what I learned in that, in that relationship. And still to today, we maybe talk, not, not every week or every month, maybe every six months or so, but we just continue our relationship from where we stopped. And just by her loving me like that, I've learned to love other people like that. If people are hard to love, it means that they, or if they struggle with relationships, building relationships, it means that they are hurting. There's definitely hurt, and we need to break through those barriers. We need to serve them and listen to them and seek to understand, because behind every person there is a story. Um, it happens in the world and it happens in church, like I said. Um, yesterday, Maritza and Paige and I went for a breakfast and um, it was so lovely. We had a deep discussion, and as women do, and we saw this lady and we were just busy talking about how when you don't feel good about yourself, how you can't, um, you just can't be nice to other people, you know, and um, the next moment, we made you put her hand up because she needed to go to, to teach a student and, um, you know, we needed to go, so we wanted the book. And um, this lady came over that we didn't see before and um, she's, she's like, okay, what? And Paige says, can we have the book, please? And she walked away while talking to us, so we didn't really know what she was saying. We caught one or two words and thought, okay, let's just ask, you know. We called her back over and... Um, at first she said she was busy, then she came, and um, then she was so rude to us. She said, you can't ask for the bill this way, you've got to ask for it this way. And we were like, okay, well, we didn't know, but she was really, she came that close to Paige's face and told her that she's the owner and we should leave. I've never been chased out of a restaurant, neither have they. We've never ever experienced anything like this. But this lady was standing there and all we wanted to do, do was to try and understand what did we do wrong. We didn't know. But anyway, you know, we spoke to somebody else and he just said, you know, obviously he was very afraid of her as well, so he just said, well, we'll just leave. And, um, but she was standing there in an emotional state. She started crying or welling up while she was talking to us and telling us, there's the door and we need to leave now and never come back. But, you know, afterwards we were all shocked and we didn't, we didn't know what was going on and we didn't, it was just so unreal. But afterwards when I thought about it, I thought, wow, you know, she, she said that, she did tell us before she started crying that something is really, you know, she's going through something that she can't discuss with us now. And I just thought, you know, that's the thing in the world as well. People are hurting and that causes them to be really rude to other people. And um, that it just reminded me not to look at how they treat you within the church and in the world, but to see the story behind the person and to have that compassion, to look at people with the eyes that Jesus has and to love them with his heart. Um, so, yeah, if you, on the other side, when you are the, when you receive input, it's very important to have humility, you know, to seek for that, to seek that input and not to be on your own. Because being on your own, I mean, maybe I have been trying to do that in my life, you know, especially when I hurt, I pull back. When I go through a difficult time, I do pull back. But I've learned during the years that one of my friends once said to me that, um, I know it's not going well with you when you don't phone me. <laughs> and that's so true, you know, because then you get self-focused and you're trying to work out what's going on, why you're worried or whatever. But that's important. Do not try and do it on your own. Yeah. And also to trust that um, God gives us people. Like God gave the eunuch that didn't understand the scriptures. He gave him... was. Um, I forgot his name now. Uh, me too, Philip. Yeah, Philip. Yes, yes. Philip. And, and that story is just so amazing to know that God knew that that guy was going to travel that road and he put yeah. Philip there. He put him in his life to make things clear for him. So God puts people in our lives to, to tell us things. He works through the people around us to help us. And 
we need to be vulnerable because without vulnerability, we can't have deep connections with each other. We can't help each other. Somebody said to me once also when I was in a terrible place spiritually, she said to me, Lizelle, if you're 50% open, I can help you 50%. But if you're 100% open, I can help you 100%. And it makes so, it made so much sense that time, you know, but I just couldn't do it. But that was a lesson. I had to go there to learn that lesson. Oh. Come on, Lisa. Um, yeah, and just another thing. This scripture is just so amazing that God wants us to help each other. He's talking about... Um, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will, be, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And, you know, it's not like we, we shouldn't judge each other. We shouldn't judge each other ever. Mm -hmm. But we must... If we look at ourselves and we take the plank out of our own eye, then we are able to help our brother with a speck in his eye. Because you won't be in a place where you judge him or where you want your opinion to be, you know, served. You'll be in a humble place where you help him because of love. And if love is the basis, then, you know, if we love like Jesus loved, then we can't go wrong. I just wanted to end with a... Um, Do you want to say anything more? This is sort of just a summary slide. Yeah, you read it? yeah that's fine. Um, I read this and I thought, this is just so amazing. It says, don't cross oceans for people who wouldn't cross a paddle for you. Wow. Line through it. And then it says, no, do it. Do cross, do cross oceans for people. Love people, all people. No conditions attached. No wondering whether or not they're worthy. Cross oceans, climb mountains. Life and love isn't about what you gain. It's about what you get. Mm -hmm. Because you get givers and you get takers. And I think it's so important for all of us to learn to be giving to one another. Because that is so, you know, that is Jesus' heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, uh, last week, we, at the end of the, of the lesson, we handed out pieces of paper. And, and I just want to say thank you for everyone who did you know, raise questions, concerns, gave some inputs, and made some requests. So I actually got a long list of it. Um, and I thought maybe we can discuss it today. And I thought, wow, there will just not be enough time. But what I thought about is what, some practicals that's important. Well, before we get to that, I just want to encourage everyone, if there are some more questions, some more concerns, maybe there are some personal deep stuff that's maybe a little bit confidential or whatever, but you feel really on your heart to discuss it, please feel free to speak to the Zell I or Tidu Joe, Tim and Chevy, uh, you know, or your family group leader or Malcolm. Please let's have the conversations out there. If anything we, we are talking about here makes you feel uncomfortable, brings back memories of, of awful experiences, please be open. Let's, as I said a few times now, let's have a conversation, let's have a dialogue. But if we are ready to do this, I think a few, a few practicals that will help is, is if we can look at our family group, the relationships we've already got in the family group, I think it's important to make sure that we've got good, strong relationships there. If we can have a functional discipling relationships with our, in our family group to start from there, that will help the family group to be really healthy because it means we are in one another's lives. That's all it means. It just means that we are, our relationships there is, is, is not just based on a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting in some cases. It's, just, it's not just eat and miss, but we are walking together. You know. What's that term of you, of you guys? Forgot again. Um, doing life together. Doing life together, sorry. Right. And so, you know, and I think that's important. So it's, it's, it's a great place to start, but then also to see people who can give spiritual input in all the different areas of our lives. And especially people with specific challenges. You know, let's, let's understand what those challenges are. Don't just keep quiet. If you feel that your needs are not met, if you feel it can't be met within the family group, 
widen the circle, widen the net, speak to the leaders, speak to the family, to different people, you know, just, just it's, have the conversation. If, 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 if your needs are not met, that is a serious issue. We want to know about that. And family group leaders, I believe the most important responsibility is to, is to know what the needs are in a family group and to take the responsibility to make sure they are, they are met. Make sure that people have relationships that are helpful, that are effective, that, that, that do work. And then I think important, rely on the scriptures. You know, sometimes our relationships are nice and deep and we can talk about everything, um, but, but are the scriptures involved? Are we bringing one another to the scriptures? I think that's, I've always found that that is, you know, it's so much more powerful because that is a final word, right? Now, I can babble on and on and on and on, and you're probably already sick of me. But uh, it's, at the end, if I open up the scriptures and I look at that, if somebody showed me a verse and I look at it and I apply it to my life, I, I can't argue. And I think that is important, whether we are encouraging one another or, or warning or admission, admonishing, whatever is required. So, um, and then I think last one is let's forgive easily. You know, when a bunch of sinners are together, sin will happen. And that sin is normally... You know, damages relationships. And, and, and unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, we are going to keep on making mistakes, hopefully less and less, and we will learn, we will grow, and, but things will still happen. We, there will be nasty misunderstandings. There will be completely insensitive comments. There will be something somebody said that they do not understand the backstory and just sort of steamroller over your you know, tender heart or whatever it is. So let's be, let's be honest. It's going to happen. But I think what's most important is that we are easy, quick to forgive. And I think that's what the scriptures call us to, no matter what people do to us, and no matter whether they, you know, whether they actually repent or, or apologize, we always have to be quick to forgive, to forgive easily. Um, I had this on last week. I think the application is, let's take, let's take this to heart. Let's come, have a conversation. Let's take personal responsibility. We've got our own lives and, and see how we can, how we can, all those relationships forward. Um, I think we've just run out of time. Thanks a lot. Come and speak to us. If there's anything more, we will keep continue to talk about this in the leadership group. We will take this forward. I've heard we've got so much feedback that we need to now understand what is next. What are the next steps? And so over the next weeks and months, hopefully you'll hear more about this. Uh, I've already got some feedback that it would be great to have some practical classes. We'll see how we can all do all that. Um, I hope there will be other people that will also do the classes. I feel woefully unqualified. Um, but together, I think we can make this great figure. Remember, what's the vision? Let's, let's make Jesus' bride as pure and perfect as it possibly can be. Thanks for your attention. Thanks,